Section 5 of A Bunch of Keys, Where They Were Found and What They Might Have Unlocked, A Christmas Book, edited by Tom Hood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wayne Cook. The Key of the Piano, Part 1 by T. Archer. Franz Wilhelm and myself were schoolfellows and fast friends when we were both boys learning our lessons with old Father Schmidt at Heidelberg. Had we become Bruchen at the university, I should have called him Drutzbuda, for he was dearer to me than were my own kindred. Then my elder brother at Frankfurt, who, when my mother died, sent me to be brought up by my father's sister, or then my third half-cousin Anna, whom he married, and who, such is destiny, disliked my remaining in the house lest people should imagine that I was her child, she being of greater age than Carl, and accustomed to the well-ruling of her household. My father's sister, who in much kindness undertook me, was a spinster, and in the uphill street of the town kept a little shop for the sale of spectacles and wood carvings to the English and other visitors, so that she was of some consideration, and lived so quietly that, but for her intimacy with the wife of Master Schwartz, foreman at the leather factory, musician and mender of organs, I should have known no companions at home. Master Schwartz and his wife were quiet folks, with only one daughter, little Mina, who, when I first saw her, looked so pretty in her red skirt and tiny white cap that I felt at the moment a love-inspiring admiration which, had it not been that I myself was but an infant, would have thrust a fatal barrier between Franz and me. Franz, however, had not then arrived, but came soon afterwards in charge of an old nurse, who, having cared for him from the time of his birth, and being now on her way to end her days with her relatives at Mannheim, was commissioned to leave him thenceforth with Madame Schwartz, who had been an own servant companion to his grandmother. For the mother of Franz was daughter of a Herr sub-deputy, but who was her husband, or whether she had been married, nobody knew if Madame Schwartz did not, and she certainly never mentioned it to her dying day. The poor mother was now dead, and the wife of the sub-deputy also, and it was at the instance of the sub-deputy himself that the little fellow, who had a small annual sum settled on him, was confided to Master Schwartz, and became foster-brother to Mina. The curious thing was that as these two children grew, there was a strong resemblance between them, so that they might have passed for brother and sister by blood, rather than by that affinity of mind growth which, as some have said, will control the features of the face into outward likeness by the force of inward sympathy. However this may be, they were the same in the color of hair and eye, which in both were dark and in that long visage and more prominent featuring that belong scarcely to the German type most common, and of which I myself am an example. It was perhaps the contrast between us which drew Franz and me into close fellowship, for it is by contrasts that we are attracted, and by the hope of finding in the mind and temper of another that which is wanting in our own, our earliest affections are made lasting. My first child liking for Mina was transferred thereafter to Franz, and he became my brother as she became his sister. So when he was to study music, I also entreated of my brother Carl through a letter that I might be a musician, and had indeed already learned of one of the band who played in the gardens on the hill to blow the instrument of which I am now a professor. 
They were quiet, happy days when we used to go up to those gardens after school and sit under the trees looking down upon the broad silver band of the Necker flowing through the light green fields. All found our way from the donkey boys and the beggars to the Wurschwunden, or the wooded hill where the yoked oxen toiled up the steep, and the great dogs of the farmers follow the team, themselves looking like the wolves which are there no longer. This quiet life of study and friendship was soon to end, or rather to change, as must all the events of this mortal life. For Franz was grown into a youth, and Mina had budded into a gray, sweet, dark-eyed maiden, still with that wonderful resemblance to her foster brother, which, though not always apparent, made itself known by a sudden turn of expression, or a moment's glance of the eye, or a quick movement of the head. Franz was, as I have said, dark and with deep brown clustering hair. In his shape, too, he was small and delicate, unlike me, who then began to grow of the figure that belongs to many of our nation, and with the fair face and yellow hair that might be seen any day amongst the Bruchen at the Hirschgasse, in mental as well as physical qualities that Franz differ from many of our countrymen, since he lacked that calm which is sometimes mistaken for stodelity by those who do not understand composure and a quiet self-sestination that accepts all things as of course. It is the want of this which renders your English manners restless, uneasy, and affected, for the Englishman is ever haunted by the fear of being ridiculous and in terror of seeming foolish is seldom either wise or dignified in outward bearing, while we Germans are either too self-satisfied or too self-oblivious to be conscious of what to others may seem to be absurdity in our common actions, and gravely commit with simplicity little acts of personal folly to be detected in which an Englishman would redden and almost die for shame in consequence of his exaggerated self-importance. Something of this was, I fear, in the nature of Franz, who was ever sensitive to anything affecting his individuality, and united to this was the kind of ability which he exhibited in acquiring any sort of knowledge up to the point of display, and then leaving it for some fresh theme. I have said that he had genius, however, which gift was not to me awarded at my birth, though I succeeded by application in attaining many things, and at length in becoming a professor of the art which I adopted. Genius, however, will go far in music, and especially with the piano, which was the instrument to which my friend devoted himself, first under the instruction of Master Schwartz, and afterwards at the Conservatoire at Ghent, to which he had an introduction. I must say, in the all-truthfulness which I desire to preserve, that Franz was not a great musician, no, nor even a great player, but to him belonged a fascination which made what he did original, lifelike, inspired. And to this sole brilliancy he owed his success, and the name which he was acquiring as a master of harmony when the events happened which I am now to relate. As I have said, I applied to my brother Carl for permission to adopt music as a profession, and he consented that I should commence to study at the same time as Franz. But in a year after that he came himself to Heidelberg, and proposed that I should go back with him to Frankfurt, where I might lodge near him and pursue my education under professor in that town, until I was able to undertake engagements for my self-support. This I was willing to accomplish, though not without many tears and embraces could I bring myself to part with my good aunt, and especially with my brother and sister, Franz and Mina, to whom, alas, a great calamity was soon to happen in the death of Master Schwartz, 
who, falling from a high ladder at the leather factory, was so injured that he survived but five months. This compelled Madame and Mina to let their house and betake themselves to Ghent, where a relative of the family, an assistant secretary in the town council house, had a brother, the owner of a large hotel, where Madame and her daughter would be welcomely received as housekeeper, manageresses, the owner being widowed of a young wife not nine months before. At Ghent also went Franz with them, for at Ghent he could pursue his study of music and with his small annuity, which still continued to be paid, could live at the hotel until such time as he obtained pupils when he should be old enough, or procured an engagement to control the piano at some assembly concert room. Arrived at Frankfurt, I lived in an atmosphere of music for some time. Otherwise my existence would have been sufficiently monotonous, for my brother's wife seldom asked me to her house when she entertained her acquaintances, and though I had made companions of two or three of my fellow students, I was too poor to invite them often to my room, and they in truth were generally too gay for me to hope to keep up with them in expenses. None of these took a place in my regard which I had always been held by Franz and the holidays of the year to which I looked forward with most heartfeltness were the visits that, every winter, I paid to my dear brother and sister, and that which in the summer Franz managed to pay to me. It was on one of these occasions, when we had both begun to earn our own living by our art, that he proposed to go to London, where he had, he said, some expectation of obtaining a handsome engagement at a series of concerts, the agent for which had visited him in Ghent, and where he also believed that I could obtain better employment. It ended in our making the journey together and in our being employed in the same orchestra, he as an accompanist with an occasional solo, I as one of the ordinary band. In London so many opportunities open themselves that those who are proficient in their art find the means of ready occupation and to both of us fresh engagements for performance in public and for teaching were soon presented. Franz, as I have said before, possessed a genius to which I could lay no claim, and quickly he passed beyond me and became famous not only as a pianist but also as a teacher whose connection was growing daily the more extensive and high place. His absence grieved me not, since it caused no diminution of our friendship, but the rather, as I thought, caused my brother to rely on my true feeling and sympathy when he told me of his successes with the simplicity of the old days when we were boys at Hartleburg, sitting in the hill garden. One anxiety was mine, and it arose from my perception of the truth that Franz loved not his art so much for its own sake as for the fame and distinction which it might be made to bring him. He seemed to me unaccountably to look beyond it to something further, the real nature which I could not then determine, but which I afterwards learned was the delusion of his life. Those are best acquainted with the members of the musical profession, who are much occupied in teaching, will know how often they are received with confidence in well-placed and even distinguished families, and how it becomes almost a matter unavoidable that they are on terms familiar with the daughters of the houses where they teach. It is to me sorrowful to know that there are some who abuse this confidence, and through the opportunity afforded them of unrestricted companionship, under the softening influence of music, use the intimate relation of teacher and pupil to mislead the young girls by false flattery and foolish coquetting into sentiments which sometimes end in dishonorable passion. This is detestable. But it may be remembered, too, that there are among the young and well-born ladies of this cold and conventional England, some who secretly will escape from the restraint demanded by the society, and who, either unconscious of their own power or always vain of the influence wrought by their beauty and familiar disdainful concessions, 
lure their admirers to the madness of believing themselves favored, and then turn haughtily away with pretended surprise. I would have staked my life upon the honor of Franz Wilhelm, and though we were now much separated and lived in different quarters of the town, he near his fashionable pupils at the west end of London, and I in a more modest lodging in the suburb, we met frequently and with the same simple confidence as ever. Nevertheless, I was struck with an indefinable feeling of dismay when one evening he came into my room flushed and excited, and after we had smoked a cigar together, took from his breast a case containing the portrait of a lady. It was a beautiful face, but with nothing in it of softness, a dark, haughty, aristocratic face, with a smile upon its lips such as I love not to see, and with a cruel downward look of the eyes shining beneath drooping lids. Despite my forebodings, I affected to banter with him, and said, Who hast thou here, brother? Is it a prima donna who has taken the captive with her singing in Semiramid? Or art thou bringing forth a pupil to the profession, who looks thus on the orchestra and keeps her tender glances for thee? But he stayed me with a gesture almost fierce, so hasty was it, and showed me within the case at the back of the picture a little scented pink three-cornered note which he opened and placed in my hand. It had evidently accompanied the portrait, and was written in such words as women learn to write too early, words which seem to mean much, and might mean nothing. To Franz they might bear heaven knows what of feverish hope and ambition's unrest. To me they were an index to the face that I had just looked upon the heartless amusement of a haughty woman who played with the love she laughed at. For some time I could learn but little, and sat looking painfully at my friend, whose health always had been delicate. To me it seemed affected, either by long professional work or by some deep anxiety. His flushed face grew paler, and as he placed his hand upon my arm, I could feel it tremble. I could see how white and thin it had grown. He was being consumed by some restless fever which would soon, if it had not already, become a serious disease. When he at last came to speak of the writer of the note, the original of the portrait, I learned that she was one of his pupils, the daughter of a wealthy English Mr. Sir whose title had been bestowed upon him in consequence of his great affairs in the city, and who had married the daughter of a lord. Franz swore to me that when he gave the first lesson on the piano to this proud and handsome miss, he felt a sort of terror, a presage of what must come to him in love for her, and that he set his mind to keep himself from trespass in look or word. But she, whose character was that of haughty contempt to her attendants, and of cold indifference to many of the guests who came there to visit, continually regarded him with meaning glances and glad smiles. Often she made the lesson longer and prevailed on him to stay, and by a hundred tokens led him on to believe that she held him in her favor. Not in these terms did he to me relate the course she had pursued, for he still cherished deep down in his heart the faith that she loved him too much to regard the cold rules of the world, and lest he should fear to declare himself, had given him hope and courage. Not yet had he spoken to her of love except by illusion and by all those smallest familiarities which she permitted, and which none but lovers or dear friends exercise. He had kissed her hand, had composed and written love songs for her to play, had played them to her 
with her round white arm leaning on his shoulder as he sat at the piano. And now, in answer to a request so full of meaning that he feared it had sealed his fate, I was doubtful of its boldness. She had sent the picture and the letter that I saw. "'But you yourself shall see her, Emile,' he cried, as I endeavored to reason with him prudently. "'That haughty expression is not meant for me. To my appeal it answered with a smile as soft and gracious as that of the angel in the old picture at Ghent, which we have stood so many times to look at together. "'Tis useless to speak to me of prudence now. Prudence is vanquished by love. Let me tell you, dear friend, I am making money. I could afford to marry, even if she were poor. Heaven, how I wish she had not been born rich. And yet, no, for then we should never have met. I broke through this rhapsody by inquiring when he intended to go to fulfill his engagements at Ghent, where he had undertaken to direct some concerts. Ah, that is it, he replied sadly. I go in three days from Tuesday, and it is now Sunday. But before I leave England, I know my fate, whether I am to come back to claim her. So far had his infatuation carried him. But listen, Emile, you shall see her too on that same night, for there is to be an assembly of her father's guests, and I have undertaken to find performers who can play the music of the latest operas during the supper. You, of course, will come, and when it is all over and the guests have gone, I will ask her that which shall make or destroy me. It was useless to reason further, and I could only embrace him and let him depart. The house of the wealthy English Sir is, was a fine mansion, stately standing in its own pleasure garden in Brompton, or at least beyond Piccadilly, whether we went, I and others of the band, in a cab, on the night when I was to meet Franz there and to see the lady with whom he had become enslaved to madness. Arrived, we found that the carriage drive was full of vehicles, and we, with our instruments, entered on foot to see Franz in the hall speaking, as we believe, to the Sir Joseph, who, since the loss of his wife, himself attended to the arrangement of his assemblies in such things as were refused by his daughter. Her I saw presently when we went up to the room above, where she sat queenly on a sofa to receive the guests, with that same high, proud, cruel expression upon her face by which I remembered her in her portrait. Even as I looked at her, however, I saw it change to a smile, half amused, half contemptuous, and she turned and whispered something to her younger sister. A girl of thirteen years, to me it seemed, and shrugged her shoulders with a short, mocking laugh. I turned to the direction her eyes had taken, and saw Franz directing our band where to seat themselves, on a little red cloth-covered platform in an alcove. His face beamed, his eyes sparkled. <laughs> Alas! Then he had seen the smile, but not the contempt that lay hidden therein, or the cruel laugh which followed it. Many guests were there, and soon the rooms, which were large, brilliantly lighted, and handsomely furnished, were thronged. We played the newest music from the last operas, and sometimes a dance, in which the lady, Adeline was the name by which she was called, once or twice joined, having for her partner a tall, broad man, who came in with the swinging step of a dragoon, and who, though he was perhaps not more than eight-and-twenty, had a face in which it was easy to see the marks of free living and, and the coarse redness of the bon vivant, not too particular in his potations. Very strong and heavy he seemed as he turned round his bulky frame and leaned down to talk to his partner until his tawny red moustache nearly brushed her cheek. 
but he was evidently a privileged person, for though she at first treated him with her natural hauteur, she seemed constrained to laugh at his sallies, whatever they may have been, since he laughed loudly at them himself. Oh, dear brother, I thought sadly as I saw him go up to Sir Joseph and smite him upon the shoulder. This is the father suitor, and no doubt a lord, as indeed so it proved in event, for I soon heard him addressed by the name of Lord George. Franz, who conducted our band, had little opportunity of remarking this man, who moved about the rooms with a sort of swaggering ease, and was to me so offensive in look that I could not but follow him with my eyes, especially when he lounged over the sofa where the daughter of the house sat, and again laughed boisterously at some joke which seemed to be directed against us, as I saw her look quickly in the direction of the orchestra. Presently some of the guests asked her to play to them on the piano, and after a moment's refusal she consented, beckoning Franz at the same time to come thither. With his face suffused with that same look of anxious tenderness which I had noticed in the evening when he spoke of her to me, he went. She performed, but indifferently, it was evident that she regarded with more particularity the position of her arms and the movement of her plump white hands over the keys than the rendering of the notes. Still there was great applause, and she told Franz to find another piece and to stay by her chair to turn over the leaves of the music. She played this mechanically, and I could see that as he stooped forward, she was talking to him, and that his face was flushed. He sat down afterwards by her request, and she remained standing by his side. Never had I heard him play so well. I have said that he had genius, and it burst forth as he ran his fingers over the keys in a wild outpour of harmony which hushed the buzz of conversation in the rooms, and soon brought a knot of people round the piano where he was sitting, I believe, unconscious of the presence of any but the woman on whose face his eyes were fixed. He seemed to be under a spell, and to translate the incantation that had bound him into music. At that moment Lord George strode across the room. "'Devilishly good, but rather long,' he said, with a coarse laugh. "'Can't he change it into a waltz, Adeline?' She echoed his laugh by a titter, which was taken up by two or three of the company who were of the high breeding and ashamed to have been betrayed into interest. Franz sprang up. The fire had died out of his eyes. He had turned pale. The gentleman prefers a waltz, he said to us, waving his hand almost contemptuously, and he came and took up his place among us only one glance of intelligence passing between him and me as he pressed my arm in passing. Supper was served in a large lower room with furniture splendid and costly, and leading by doors of stained glass to a broad stone balcony overlooking the pleasure garden. For the present these rooms were open, and a sort of tent lifted itself over the balcony where we were to perform, and where also a table was laid for our refreshment, with wines and such dishes as we chose to ask should be brought by the servants. Franz came backwards and forwards, for he had been invited to sup at the table with the guests, and yet it liked him not to desert us. I could see that he was restless and excited, and noticed painfully that he twice stole to the back of the chair on which sat the lady daughter next to Lord George, who had taken her down to supper, and after a word or two went back uneasily. He ate scarcely anything either, which to me is an evil sign, since it is ill for a German when he eats not. Only when we were putting up our instruments and about to leave did he come up to me and, taking my hand, whisper, 
I remain here, dear Emile, for a time until I can know what is my fortune. But I will come forth to thee at once, tonight. So secure for me the bedroom which thy landlady has to spare. And after I had left him there, happened this. Most of the guests had gone, only a few being left upstairs taking coffee, amongst whom was Lord George, drinking liqueur and not quite sober. Franz had descended to the supper-room to collect his music, and waited there believing that presently would come down the high-bred Adeline, and that he would then secure the opportunity for which his heart was bursting to speak to her boldly before he left London. It was in this room that he had been used to giving her those lessons which had, alas, been so fatal to him. And even now her piano stood open between the windows under the great mirror. So as she came not, he sat down to it and began to play one of the love songs which he had written for her, and to sing in a low voice her name, wedded to new words. Looking up presently, on hearing the opening of the door and the rustle of a rich dress, he saw her in the mirror above, coming softly into the room, and in another moment felt her arm upon his shoulder. He seized her hand and kissed it, and it was not withdrawn. As she bent beside him, he saw that a long dark tress had escaped from the diamond comb that confined her hair, and having grown bolder, begged her to give it him. She asked him why he wanted it, and trembling with emotions, he said as a gage d'amour. He had risen from the piano and looked her in the face fearing that he had said too much. But she only answered with a laugh, in which he could see nothing of the scornful, and said, Oh, true, you are going away, and I had almost forgotten it. Quick, then, take off this curl with your penknife, and you, too, must give me one of yours until you come back, so that there shall be a romance. With a trembling hand he severed a thin, shining band from the tress which she held out to him in her white fingers, then pressed it passionately to his lips, and placed it in the case where her portrait already lay, next his heart. She all the time regarding him with that haughty, cruel smile, having something in it of amusement and contempt. Taking the penknife from him, she then cut away a thick, crisp curl from his temple, and held it twined round her thumb, while she went to a writing-case for an envelope in which to place it. Words which he longed to speak struggled for utterance. It was difficult for him to forget that she was his pupil only, that she was also the high-bred daughter of the Sir Joseph, while he was but a musician the teacher of an art whose professors are often regarded with contempt. This he had learned as a part of his English experience. Best beloved and dearest miss, he said presently, taking both her hands, to say that you know not my adoration would be untrue. To be absent from you has to me become insupportable, since my heart is ever burning with your self-inspired devotion. I leave the place where I have found the happiness of my life. Oh, you are going abroad, replied she, and you will leave me all alone, expecting that I shall practice the lessons you have taught me while you are away. But that I will not do, for we too leave town shortly, and I vow I will not play again until you are with me, Herr Tutor, in token of which see here and she placed inside the piano the envelope containing the curl which he had cut from his temple, then locked it and handed him the key. You give me then to hope, he asked passionately, seizing her hand and pressing it upon his heart. Hope what? she said quickly, looking him in the face. Hope whatever you dare hope. They were pacing the room together, and had entered the balcony, as he poured out a confused torrent of words, the confession of a passion so long concealed and downkempt. As they stood by the balustrade, where the edge of the tent had been lifted, they could see the garden all bathed in the pure moonlight. 
He had sunk upon his knee, and his tears were wet among the diamonds that sparkled on her wrist. Both were absorbed, for perhaps even she had for a moment been carried out of herself by the force of his heartfelt words, when they heard a loud crash as of broken glass, and there stood Lord George, stumbling amongst the empty champagne bottles which we had left behind the door. He swung around with an oath, and before Franz could recover his feet, had seized him by the collar. The high-born Adeline lost, but for a moment, her composure. And then she said, You may spare your bad language, George. Let this gentleman go. We were only carrying out a scene of private theatricals a little too far. But Lord George, who was too tipsy to hear this sort of explanation, struck Franz a blow upon the breast before he could struggle to his feet, and caused him to fall back heavily. Perhaps neither the blow nor the vile epithets which his lordship used would have so affected my poor brother, but for the cruel words spoken by her to whom he had just been pouring out the love wealth of his soul. But when his foe once more attempted to seize him, swearing that he would kick him out of the house, Franz threw up his hand, and twisting his fingers into my lord's neckcloth, which came away in the struggle, closed with the strong man. Both of them went reeling against the balustrade, and Lord George was using every effort to throw his more active antagonist over into the garden when part of the stonework gave way, and both together went crashing down with it to the lawn below. Franz was undermost, and lay for a moment stunned and bleeding, but Lord George extricated himself, and as he did so kicked the prostrate man as heavily as his thin patent leather boots would permit. There was a crowd round them by this time, and amongst them the Sir Joseph, several servants, the latter of whom attempted to raise Franz, but he shook them off and staggered to his feet, looking up to the balcony where the high-bred daughter still stood pale and frightened, but cold and cruel still. "'Let him go at once,' she said to her father, who had asked her what was the matter. "'I had been jesting with Herr Wilhelm, and he forgot himself.' Late that night, a cab that had furiously driven along the street stopped at the door of the house where I lodged, and Franz, pale, bleeding, and covered with dirt, staggered in without a hat. At first I thought he had been rejected and had sought consolation at a tavern, but this was so contrary to his to me well-known character that I was filled with apprehension as he sank gasping into a chair, and I saw the mingled froth and blood upon his lips. It was not till I had tried to soothe him, and he had gone to bed, that I learned all that had happened. And then he became so exhausted that, late as it was, I sent out the landlady's son for a physician. For two days he lay there delirious, and even when the fever had left him, he was still so weak that, though the doctor said there was no vital injury, he looked very gravely at me and advised that as soon as he could bear the journey, he should be sent to his friends at Ghent. Poor dear Franz! What friends had he but Mother Schwartz and the good Mina? But they were better than I, though I did my best to nurse him and sat with him night and day, weeping as I listened to his rambling, feverish talk, and heard the cough which shook his slender frame. At length he was strong enough to go, and I went with him, to leave him safely in the care of the two good women, who had already prepared a pretty cheerful room in the quietest part of the great hotel, and were both full of glowing anticipations that he would soon recover. For myself, I said goodbye, and we embraced with mutual tears, for something told me I might not see him again, and though he might recover, I might be the one to die. For though to him I told it not, I knew the duty which I had taken upon myself to do. He was my Dutzbuta, and I must avenge him on the Lord George whenever I could meet with that bloated 